Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm an alcoholic. Politics and AA. I don't know what he's talking about. It's just one big fellowship here. Now that we've stopped drinking, our halos shine, and we never argue about anything. That may be the punctuation in the big book. Or gratitude. That's a controversy. I mean, the great thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is you never know when one old-timer in a walker is going to get in a fist fight with another old-timer in the walker. At an intergroup meeting, you know? I love that. Remember, um, uh, second edition is my favorite edition of the big book, and in the professor in the paradox, he says that Alcoholics Anonymous was born in a riot. <laughs> and uh, so if you're here expecting utopia, uh, this is a very human place, and I don't think I could have survived my sobriety dates May 25th, 1979, and uh, I, I couldn't have survived in a place that wasn't very human, uh, which is the most spiritual of all conditions, I think. Uh, I think on 62, 63, that's what Bill's really telling me. You know, Bill says, uh, he compares us, <clears throat> says we're an extreme example of selfishness and self-centeredness, not a unique one, not even the most extreme. Sometimes I want to take my alcoholism and make it a badge. You know, make it different than those normies, those normies who don't have a program. You know why normal people don't have a program? They don't need one. <laughs> They don't need a sponsor to tell me the kinds of things my sponsor tells me. <laughs> you know, if drinking is like hitting yourself in the head with a hammer, most people who do it would do it once and stop. And even if they did it compulsively, they probably wouldn't have to go to meetings for the rest of their life not to hit themselves in the head with a hammer. But we come here every day so we don't hit ourselves in the head with a hammer and we get more spiritual than the rest of the people on the planet. <laughs> and we say, those normies, they don't have a program. That's right. This is, who's their, this is their first year? First year of sobriety. All right. I am so sorry for you. God. <laughs> you are in Loserville here, you know. <laughs> You really screwed up. You're an Alcoholics Anonymous, the lamest place on the face of the earth. You're sitting in chairs that the Baptist youth just got out of. On a Friday night, listen to some mook talk about God so you don't die with a big liver out to here. It's so sad what has happened to us. Oh, you're an alcoholic? Not oh, so sad. I'm going to tell you. You know, it just is. And you know, the worst thing about ending up in AA is all the stupid people in your life were right. <laughs> all the stupid people. Your high school principal, you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to get in trouble. The nuns, you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to get in trouble. Your pastor, your rabbi, you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to get in trouble. Here you are. Friday night, could be out in the boat, drinking, being somebody. Nope, you're here. <laughs> Listening to some idiot from California when you could have brought somebody in from Texas or Oklahoma to do this talk just as well. <laughs> talk about God or you're going to die with a big fat liver out here. It's really sad, sad. Yeah, newcomers, you're in a room full of losers. These people can't split a pint or they will die. <laughs> It's how sad Alcoholics Anonymous is. You know, we really want to think it's hip, especially in California. Everybody, you know, because I do. I've gone to meetings with like four or five Academy Award winners in the room and, you know, lots of porn actresses. And uh, <laughs> I have one friend says you can't have too many porn actresses in a movie, in a, in a meeting. And uh, <laughs> it's always nice to take a group conscience on those meetings. And... Uh, 
So it's a little different out there. But you know, in California, you forget. You think AA was started like in Big Sur, Laguna Beach, in a hot tub. No. Alcoholics Anonymous was started in Akron, Ohio. The lamest place on the face of the earth. In 1935, by, by men who were more white than Wonder Bread. And more conservative than Goebbels. I tell you, I mean, Bill Wilson used to get drunk and write letters to Franklin Delano Roosevelt calling him a communist, telling him he needed to resign. Alcoholics Anonymous is the Chevrolet of spirituality. You don't astral project. <laughs> You don't get to go back to Rome and meet your relative. You just get to haul some stupid newcomer to a meeting. <laughs> it's about as spiritual as it gets here. <laughs> you know, and if you're lucky, if it's real spiritual, they'll vomit in your car. <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine, I just spoke at a conference, and this friend of ours said, this is great. It's the best com comment I've ever heard about Alcoholics Anonymous. said, Alcoholics Anonymous. Staying sober a long time in Alcoholics Anonymous is like getting kicked to death by rabbits. <laughs> Isn't that great? It's like, that's it. That's it. And you know, it's just the fact is there's no place else to go. I mean, I, I'd go somewhere else, but I'll drink if I do. And then whatever problems I've got today with you people will go away. See, because that's really the problem I have, is you. It doesn't surprise me we need to tell you not to park and no parking. It doesn't surprise me. My God, we get on airplanes and they say, do not disconnect the smoke alarm. Why would you tell that to somebody who's on an airplane that if it catches on fire, they're going to die? Why? They're, honest to God, in the valley there's a sign that says, all right to make a left turn, here's the part, if safe. <laughs> Why do I have to tell people that? Shouldn't they be able to figure that out themselves? People tick me off. You irritate me. You irritate me when you're not even doing it. There was a guy on the airplane, just the way he was sitting down was irritating me. The way people put their luggage in the compartment irritates me. I get irritated, see, because that's the nature of places, people, places, and things. You know, you get sober, you can move different places. You can go any place you want. I could move here. Great thing about being an AA and moving to Texas or Oklahoma is you people got to accept me or die. <laughs> I've been all over, Berlin, Costa Rica, I've been to AA everywhere, it's great, it's great. So places I can change, things, I got a few dollars in my pocket now that I'm not buying Boone's Farm apple wine or a little ripple, and uh, so I can get things. It's the people, it's the people, not just the out, all people irritate the snot out of me. Let's just take one that all irritates all of us, the crosswalk button. All right? You only have to push it once. <laughs> once you push it, the circuit is set. It doesn't matter how much you push it. That walk sign is not coming any quicker. And yet you people, just to mess with my day, stand on the corner and continually do this over and over and over again. Now, on a good day, when I've talked to my sponsor, meditated, worked the steps, and am spiritually fit, I can drive by you and go, have a nice day, brother. <laughs> On a day when I'm not working a particularly good program, I want to get out of my car and bitch slap you. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Getting on airplanes. I, I, I'm so glad that you no longer can take Aunt Martha into the airport with you. <laughs> Just us people trying to get on the plane because that's bad enough. But here's what happens on a plane. A guy gets on an airplane, his seat, his ticket says 37A. So he stops at the first row. Okay, I'm not
going to give you that one. Maybe the plane starts with 37A, all right? I'm giving you that one because I'm a humanitarian. But it says one. Oh, what a surprise. So that would think to say, move on, right? No, no, you go to the next row thinking it goes 137A. Here's alcoholics at parking. I'm, I'm in my home group, right? Now, we have my home groups. It wasn't a little church. We moved it. Little church, they have some rules for us. These people do not need an Al-Anon meeting. These are not control issues. They just have a few rules they'd like us to obey if we're going to have our meeting in their home, and they didn't ask for our vote. One of those rules is no pets in the meeting. I don't know. I don't mind. I don't mind you bring your dog to the meeting. I don't care. Oh, oh. Yeah, Texas, we always take our dogs to the meeting. <laughs> Hell, my dog sponsors me, boy. <laughs> my dog's worked the steps 37 times. <laughs> and if, of course, you don't meet her at the conference, then... That, oh, never mind. So anyway... <laughs> Is it true that when you move from Texas to Oklahoma, the IQ in both states go up? I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> Newcomers, that's called there was too much love, so I got to push them back and see if I can get them back. See? They liked me too much. I got to mess with it now. So anyway, I, I, you know, sometimes you sort of have to be, the, I'm not one of those people that like, will give you my opinion. I, I, don't, I really don't like to give my opinions to newcomers too much because they could hit you. You know, I really admire old timers that get in newcomers' faces because they forget they're detoxing. <laughs> you know, when you're detoxing, you're just a little irritable. All my guys go, I'm having feelings, I'm having feelings. I'm going, no, you're not having feelings, it's just detox. I go, thank God. Feelings happen in the second year. So, sometimes for male alcoholics, they never happen. Way too many women laughed on that. Okay. Just remember, the only thing in common with the people you date is that you picked them. So, out of all the people you could have picked, you picked them. Believe me, I wish I'd known that, uh, that having felony convictions would have made you more dateable in AA. <laughs> I wish I'd known that. I'd have got busted some more, you know? <laughs> Just didn't know. Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? That's, you know, I got this one friend that, uh, you like, almost shot his wife, you know? And when you hear him talk, the women have two reactions. Some of them are going like this. Ah! And some of them are going... Why doesn't Joe love me that much? <laughs> Joe never wanted to shoot me. I need a man who'll love me enough to kill me. <laughs> so, ay, yeah, yeah, relationships, singles and surprise. You know what? I don't know if you guys want to make this conference any bigger, but last night when I was listening to Jennifer, and if you didn't hear last night, you got to get Jennifer's tape. It was just a marvelous, marvelous talk. <laughs> Just, just terrific, and so, so much about what it's like, and, 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 and it was so humorous, and yet underneath it, there's all that pain, and, and uh, Norm A. said that Alcoholics Anonymous is a place where we, we, we uh, laugh at our misery and we cry at our joy, you know, and, and it was such a talk like that, but I was sitting over there, and so we're down, and I'm looking up, and so the only thing I could see is I couldn't see, on the sign, all I could see was this. That's a great name for a conference, Sin and Sobriety, boy. <laughs> You'll pack this place out. You'd have to get a bigger space. You could get Texas Stadium filling up with that. Have a hell of a lot of newcomers with that one, Sin and Sobriety, yeah. That's a workshop I want to go to. So I'm sitting in my, uh, <laughs> sitting in my home group, and, and uh, Adam Alabama, who was my spiritual grandmother, said, you know, sometimes you've got to suit up and be the mommy and their daddy. And this guy's walking up the street with a little dog. And, you know, the church says you can't have dogs. 
So I'm hoping, I don't know this guy, so I'm hoping to keep moving on, but now he's coming up the door, and I'm in the door, and I'm looking around to see if, you know, somebody who's not working a great program will get into his face for me, and they're not there. So I stand, and I take those deep breaths. Because, you know, when you give alcoholics bad news, they never take it well. I don't care. You can find the biggest guru in your meeting, and just let him talk a little bit. Turn around and go, shh, you watch him. You watch him. That shush is for other people. I'm the guru. I'm saying things that are important. So I go, hey, good morning, good morning. How are you? Good to see you, good to see you, good to see you. Welcome to the group. But you know what? The church, bad church, mean church, nasty church. Not me, not me, the church, church, not I. The church says you can't bring the dog into the meeting. And he said the classic alcoholic thing. It's just a little dog. <laughs> well, you see, we did, the, the church didn't say size of dog. I know they're jerks, but they didn't. But that's like, you know, it's, <laughs> that's just it. I, I really have believed that the rules be- apply to me. And, and it's okay to break them, as long as I'm willing to pay the consequence. I, I was in traffic school there. I got first ticket in a long time. I swear to God, I was the only one, and as far as I know, other alcoholics in there. And it was amazing. All these non-alcoholics. Well, I was doing 90, but so was everybody else. And, and I wasn't the O and N. And I just said, you know, I speed and I've sped a lot, and it was my turn in the barrel. Now it's here. You know, I just didn't get resentful because I actually was going that fast, and you know, you pay the ticket, you go to school, and you take care of it. And that's just a great freedom. They're not doing it to me anymore, see. Because I have the type of personality that will take an impersonal world personally. People I don't even know get up in the morning, they go, now what should I do today? Let's see. Go to the gym, go to work, and I don't know Steve Bordner, but I'm going to cut him off on the freeway. <laughs> just to mess with him. And newcomers, I'm just going to tell you, this is deep, I'm going to give you the deep spiritual stuff tonight, too. I like this, this is Baptist AA in here, too, because everybody's already talking back to the podium. Amen, bridge, hi, okay, so. So we'll all get slain in the spirit tonight for the first time. Walking on water. And talking in tongues. That's just called being drunk. You know, we did. We talked in tongues a lot. So, yeah. Our alcoholics and not. So if you're new, this is like a weird place. It's a strange place. It's full of contradictions. We call it paradox. Just to make it sound spiritual. But it's really contradictions. I was thinking about a couple of them. Here's a couple of contradictions. One thing you'll hear is somebody say, let us love you until you can love yourself. And then in the same meeting you're going to hear, what we think about you is none of your business. (laughs) You can ask one old timer, what do I do with problems? And they go, hang on. Then you're going to ask another one, they're going to go, let go. And here's my favorite. Don't make any decisions in the first year. Get a sponsor. (laughs) Weird place. Very strange. That's because the inmates run the asylum here. Just think about it. If I went back to this mythical 12-step program, you know, about hitting your head in the 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 hammer, just think, how long have you been here? 35 years. I've had to come here 35 years to keep myself from hitting myself in the head with a hammer one day at a time. You're a loser. What a loser. You're here 35 years, right? And yet if you're here 35 years, we'll bow down. (laughs) We'll think you're something special because you haven't poisoned yourself in 35 years. We are easy to impress here. It doesn't take much to impress us. And look, here's deep spiritual truth. Deep spiritual truth. I didn't make this up. Alan McGinnis, who died 10, 20 years before I got sober. uh, Wonderful speaker. Got a book called The Rest of Your Life. It's out. Just wonderful. I think on a par with the stuff Chuck C. said. Here's deep spiritual truth. This is the kind of stuff I had to come to Alcoholics Anonymous to learn. I cannot learn this without a sponsor, a home group, the steps, and divine intervention. 
Here it is. You ready? Deep breath. This is deep. Let the tailgater pass. <laughs> that amazed me the first time I heard it. I know it amazes you. <laughs> Let the tailgater pass. I'd have never thought about that without a sponsor. Without a sponsor, there's only one or two things to do to a tailgater. You slow down so their head gets big and their eyes explode. <laughs> Or you let them pass you and then you tailgate them! <laughs> but to get out of their way, let them go on, get out of your life, too long down the road, never would have occurred to me. I mean, like, there's a guy in our home group that says, they can't cut you off if you let them in. <laughs> now you say that kind of stuff in your home group when you go back, oh, he's God. He's God! Oh my God, yes! Sponsor me! Marry me! <laughs> You're a spiritual giant! Because you used to dating people who slept with your sister, spent all the money, killed the chihuahua, and then left. Now, newcomers, our job with old-timers is to mess with you. That's really all we have to do. We can't do anything for you. As somebody said, and I think they're right, our job is to mess with you till you get it. See, because we can't give it to you. You have to get it. That's usually between you and God. We're just the instrument of that. God knows. I, I, the guy that died in my home group a couple years ago, I mean, he had all the big-time sponsors in Southern California. He hung up, just died. You know? and, and, and I'll probably talk about that a little bit. But we, we, get, we get to mess with you. I mess with newcomers all the time. I love to mess with newcomers. Uh, I, I like to lie to them. <laughs> I will lie to newcomers if I think it'll keep them sober. Oh, sure, you'll get married. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sure there's a girl out there for you. Iago, I'm sure there is. Uh, the hump in your back won't make any difference. I'm sure she'll be able to look right past that. And there actually are several groups in California that uh, actually that's an asset to have. But <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, but I'll go up to a newcomer. Uh, no, what, I'll go up to a newcomer. I'll go, how long you got? I'll go, 35 days. I'll go, great. Great. 45 days, we send you a gift. <laughs> Now, I was thinking, Texas, you changed that. 45 days, we send you to the gift, but that's a whole different thing. <laughs> is, the, is the gift like the Sopranos here, or what is the gift? I'm in the gift, man, yeah. Uh. JoJo didn't work the steps. He sleeps with the fishes. The gift, everybody hears the gift, the gift. Okay. <laughs> then a movie about Satan? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> so, they, you know, they get like 55 days. They come up to me and they go, hey, where's my gift? I go, how much time you got? I go, 55 days. I said, oh, we moved that up. It's 89 days now. <laughs> and I'll play this game for about six months and finally they'll go, I know what the gift is. I know what the gift is, Steve. It's sobriety, isn't it? Go, that's right. That's the gift. <laughs> Guys will call me four o'clock in the morning. Now, she broke their heart at 9 p.m. <laughs> They can't call at 9 p.m. No, no. At 9 p.m., all they need is God, them, and the big book. They'll be fine. At 4 p.m., when there's a little mass of sobriety, they call me. She gave me God. And I go, well, read page uh, 22. <laughs> I don't know what's on 22. I haven't read 22 in years. I have no idea what it done to my head. I couldn't tell you what was on 22. Ten minutes later, thanks, Steve. 22 saved my life. Oh, God, you're brilliant. So I got to read 22, figure out what I said, so I can continue to look good. 
Now, newcomers, what they won't tell you is you're allowed to mess with us. You can mess with old timers. It's allowed. They won't tell you this, but it's allowed. And you have to understand that you have just joined the most rigid organization on the face of the earth, Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't like to think that. We like to think we're sort of bohemian and laid back. That's when we're drinking. <laughs> you get sober, you get a little rigid and opinionated about everything. Now, see, this is what happened. I was in a meeting called in La Cañada in California, and I love this meeting because they're a little older. Uh, I'm a, it's a meeting where I can still go and they'll call me kid. I like that. Because, see, the problem with staying sober 23 years is you get 23 years older, which never occurred to me. I mean, I never wanted to be the ward cleaver of my group. That was not a goal. You know, you know I'm, I'm looking at the girl I'm going to ask out, and she's going, you're so much like my dad. So it just... Because in my head, I'm not, you know, I'm still 15 in my head. You know, you start out sponsoring guys, you're the big brother, and then you could be like the father. It's weird. So they still, they're older up there, they call me kid. And I go up there and there's, you know, they give us chips. Now, I don't know if it's like this in Texas, but in California, you do not take a chip one second before it's time to take a chip. Right? So this woman's down there, and they said, anybody want to take a 30-day chip? And I just think she was trying to be nice. She was just, she was about 45, she wasn't, she just said, I have 28 days, could I take a 30-day chip? Oh, my God, you would have thought she farted. Oh, my God! Oh, no, the, no, you can't take a chip a second early. There'll be boils and plagues and grasshoppers, and we'll all die! from a group of people that only a couple of years ago left their house on Halloween to get a pack of cigarettes and woke up January 12th still in costume. <laughs> you know the little number where you got the nun on the front and the hooker on the back, that one? Yeah, I love it. You know, oh my God, you know, we weren't always on time, but you can't take a chip one second early. Oh, no. This guy, was uh, this guy was telling me a story. Uh, uh, it's a true story. This, this clubhouse was trying to run the clubhouse by the traditions. And you guys know the clubhouses aren't really AA. They're separate entities. But they were trying to run the clubhouse by the traditions. And so they were trying to figure out whether it would break the traditions to put a soda machine in the clubhouse. Now, any of you who've ever been on a committee know how long this is going to take to decide in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Congress and the Senate could pass it first. Somebody could sue and the Supreme Court would rule on it before we're going to pass it. <laughs> so they argue about this, contra pro, contra, and finally they take the vote and they vote that, you know, maybe it would be okay to put this soda machine in the clubhouse. And then this guy who's my kind of alcoholic, you know, just a pebble in the boot of AA, raises his hand and says, Mr. Chairman, there's an issue we have not addressed. And he goes, what? And he goes, I like Pepsi. Said the chairman almost killed him because he knew what it meant. You know, 17 more hours of arguing. Pepsi, Coke, Akron, New York, Bob, Bill, Clarence. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, newcomers, this is what you do. Next time your home group's going to have its yearly picnic, you go to the meeting. And as they're talking about things, you raise your hand and said, Mr. Chairman, I think this year we need to move the picnic tables over there. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest of the old timers will raise himself up on his walker to his four foot two height <laughs> say we don't move the tables at the home group here Bill Wilson had potato salad right there <laughs> Dr. Bob broke wind right? we don't move the tables here the tables were there when I got sober they're good enough for you See, because in 23 years, I'm not an old-timer. I'm just in the old-timer training program. <laughs> Place where you teach you to say things like, uh, didn't have 12 steps when I got sober. I had 37. <laughs> didn't have chairs. We sat on rocks. <laughs> didn't, didn't have coffee. We drank fungus. It was a different program. <laughs> and 
I just want to say this. I, if you're new, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the greatest time in the world to be sober. The golden age of AA has not passed, because if it has, we're all screwed. I certainly hope that the best time of my sobriety isn't past in 79, 83, 96, because I, I, you know, I hope we got another 23 years of this thing to do. I hope the really good times are in front. And unfortunately, if you listen to people like me sometimes, you'd think you got to AA by the time it was a loser. You know, and I don't know about you, but I'm tired of getting places that were better before I got there. You know, apparently this country was greater before I was born. And if you're not careful, you'll think AA was better before you got here. And here's old timers, here's how you do it to them. This conference is going to happen. You've been to 19, you've been to 16, you've been to 15, and somebody who's just come to their first one, you're going to get back off the hilltop, you're going to sit down in the meeting, and that newcomer's going to go, wasn't that conference great? And you're going to go, yeah, it's pretty good, but back in 96. In 1996, we had the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, and Liberace. <laughs> Chuck C. walked right on water that year. Walked right, right out here in the lake. Whole damn thing. <laughs> oh, bam, skinny dipped. It was the best time. <laughs> See, but this is their good old days. It's an old time, and the only thing I've got to say is, yeah, it was a great conference. It's terrific. So glad you're here. What was good about it? You know, because it's their first. And I don't want to take it away from them. This is the, you know, it's amazing because when I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, it was, what, 45 years old. What an amazing thing to join an organization that is only 45. This thing's only going to be 70. It's a baby. And if the best times happened in 50 or 60 or 80, we shame the newcomers. Like somehow we're giving them something second hand. And I've been around for 23 years. I didn't get sober in Southern California. I got sober in Columbia, South Carolina. Yeah, ooh. You know, I, believe me, there was no problem with the 13th step there because all the women were older than me and married. First AA dance I went to was like Jungle Gardenia was the primary scent. <laughs> they played Glenn Miller. You know, I go to day, dances today in L.A. and there's girls 30 days off Similac. I mean, that's a little difference. <laughs> My sponsor says I can cross the street next week if I stay sober, you know. <laughs> L.A. is a weird place for meetings, but we're talking young. So, uh... I mean, it's just, it's just, but I walked in there and they were all retired sergeant majors because there's a little place there called Fort Jackson. Some of you may have done some basic training there, so that means all the old timers are retired sergeant majors with seventh grade educations. Weren't people this college educated hippie had much in common with. But they saved my life. And they saved my life because that was the meeting to go to. There weren't a lot of me. You know, the great thing in LA is I can go to a meeting with people just like me. My meeting sort of suburban, a lot of Volvos, a lot of baby seats, a lot of people working in the studios, a lot of mommies, a lot of daddies, a lot of houses. That kind of, that's the kind of meeting. I mean, there's a lot of people just sort of middle class meeting. A little artsy, a little, little to the left. But, that, you know, and then I know people, you, you can go find any meeting you want. You want to ride with bikers? They're there. And so, so the thing about LA is I can go to people just like me. And, you know, Marie Stinner, who was here in 86, used to say that she wasn't so happy about that change in, in, in AA because uh, the pl place she went to, everybody was there. And that she'd been raped by bikers, and she had to come to Lum to learn them, love them in the meeting. And uh, the rednecks that had hurt her, she had to come to love them in the meeting. And that going with, to, to meetings with people who aren't like you was a thing. So I don't know. I, I do not believe that at its base, what was given to me in form is any different today in 2002 than it was in 1979 when those people handed it to me, although the meetings in California are very different than the meetings I went to in South Carolina. And probably very different. And that's the problem with moving. You know, when I move, I have to adjust to you. I mean, I, you know, th we didn't talk about feelings in 1979 in Columbia, South Carolina. No, those guys had never had any. Why should you? <laughs> they went through WW2 without a feeling. Yeah. 
know, and, and drugs, uh, you know, I, I always joke, when I got sober, drugs were not a controversy. When I got sober, the old timers in South Carolina did not think you weren't sober if you were on drugs. They thought you were a communist. Who'd you vote for? <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just a whole different thing. And then I move out to, and, and white, 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 white. I mean, again, it looks like Wonder Bread for the most part. You know, I've been back there, and, and it's, it's much more diversified today, which I love to see. But, but, you know, I move out to California, and I go to a midnight meeting, and I'm there with transsexuals and gang members from Thailand and, and, and you know, girls off the street. I'm going, we are not in Kansas anymore. Toto. Oh, this is wild, you know, and they're younger and weird and, and tattooed in places I don't even touch on my own body. <laughs> I mean, it was real culture shock. Uh, and, and, and I've grown to love that about Alcoholics Anonymous. A couple years ago, I, when I was married, uh, I married a woman who was having an affair when I got married. You people laugh at odd things. <laughs> so glad that makes you happy. That newcomers, if you, if you ever aspire to this job of speaking, you have to deal with that. They're weird, these people. They laugh at the strangest things. You go, they'll come before you talk, they'll go, tell that story. Remember, remember when they elected you prettiest on the cell block and stabbed you and you were in all that pain? Tell that story. I love that story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, and I thought that was weird for her to have an affair when we got married. She didn't understand the rules of cheating. You, you don't cheat at the wedding. You marry them thinking they're the love of your life. They turn into a bastard. Then you cheat on them. That's the way it goes. But I, I got to tell you, I've been depressed. I've been hurt. I was traumatized. I, I, I say that, that, that one of the things that will happen in sobriety is you're going to have the bomb go off. Maybe many times. If you are here getting sober, thinking that getting sober will now make it all okay, because we tell you it gets better, let me explain what I mean when I tell you it gets better. Because you have to be careful with a person like with me when you tell them it's going to get better. Because you say it's going to get better, and my head hears I'm going to get everything I ever wanted. If I stay sober, that will be the reward. The problem with that is, when it doesn't happen, why should I stay sober? Alan McGinnis said that if you stay in Alcoholics Anonymous long enough, you're going to get everything you ever came to get here, or you're going to find out that you're never going to get what you came to get here, and then why are you going to stay sober? See, And, and in 23 years, there's been a lot of letting go of things I thought I would get if I stayed sober been a lot of gifts, a lot of loss. That's what life's about. So you tell me I'm, it gets better, and that's what my head hears. It's not what you're saying. It's what my head hears. And, and this, is, this is what I mean when I say it gets better. Her name was Michelle. Michelle has been, no, God. You know, the dance is going to be in a little while. Just keep those hormones under check. We all know nobody's going home with anybody anyway. <laughs> it's Friday night. You don't go home with them tonight. If you do, you're stuck with them for the whole weekend. <laughs> nobody's going to anybody's room to the last dance tomorrow night. Just mellow out. Tonight it's a little shopping. That's all we're doing. <laughs> Nobody want to wake up with Mr. or Mrs. Wrong for Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> and then they're stalking you. <laughs> On water skis. Uh, <laughs> when he said he had a big boat, that's exactly what he meant. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it just, the silent news runs across here. I'm sorry. Just goes there and it comes out. Where was I? <laughs> huh? 
Michelle, thank you. Yeah, I was actually gonna get I was actually gonna get a little serious. Michelle has been dead mm, 18 years. Michelle was a dancer. And when she danced, she hurt her back. And she got a year sober, and they decided they were going to operate on her back. And they made a mistake, and they paralyzed her. She's paralyzed for a year. And then she walked again, and they did another operation, and she was paralyzed for another six months. And then in her third year of sobriety, she got lung cancer, and she died. That was it, folks. That was her whole sobriety. Now, when she was in, and when I was there when she died, she did not, and those of you who have been a caretaker know that it's not a Hollywood ending. It's ugly. It's scary, not necessarily peaceful. She was scared to death of dying. She panicked many times. She did not see death coming as a friend or looking at going home. She didn't want to go. She was not a happy camper, and yet every night she would get in the wheelchair, and while Cedar sinai still had a chemical dependency unit, would go down to that chemical dependency unit and tell those people that getting sober was worth it. That's what I mean when they say it's getting, it gets better. Because I believe it's better to live that way than not live that way, although it changes nothing. Didn't change that she died. Didn't change anything. Except for when I go over to Cedar sinai I almost always tell that story. And a couple of times there's been somebody in the group that was in that CD ward when Michelle was there, and she is remembered. So that's what I mean when I say it gets better. Because I'm selfish and self-centered. I'm still selfish and self-centered. I'm still a liar, a cheat, and a thief. I am not the well speaker. <laughs> and I really, I, and I'm the only male speaker this weekend, which I love. I think that's great. You know, usually it's like three men and one woman. I love it that it's all women and just one. I, 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 one guy. I think that's terrific. Whoever put that line up together. Jennifer certainly wasn't the well speaker last night, <laughs> and I think she'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> You know, Claire is the well speaker. Claire, you just that, that's 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 a story that will awe inspire you. And and I, I don't know about Joanne. I met her at dinner, and I'm doubtful. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm doubtful. I think it's all going to depend on how the bridge goes tomorrow. <laughs> if she loses, it may give a whole different meaning to spiritual speaker. And for you new, the spiritual meeting on Sunday just means that we don't cuss as much as we normally do. I'm not. I'm not well. And I don't want to get well. Because if I get well, what do I need you for? If I get well, I'm out of here. And there's a part of me that's looking to get well enough so I don't need you anymore. Because there's a part of me that just wants to go, I've done enough. Now you have to leave me alone. Now you have to leave me alone. A second later, I'll go, where did you go? Because <laughs> alcoholics, as the guy in the professor in Paradox said, are people who, when they're out, one in, and when they're in, they want out. <laughs> See, and I'm selfish and I'm self-centered, and I have a little story about that. This is a game I play, you're welcome to play it, and meetings that bore me. <gasps> did he say some alcoholics and anonymous meetings were boring? Boy's not grateful, is he? Well, you know what? I've been going to 23 meetings for 23 years. I've heard it all. You'll heard everything you're ever going to hear in Alcoholics Anonymous the first 30 days you're here. <laughs> there is no new information. Some of us put it in a clever package, you know, and we mix it up, and it's interesting in our stories, but there's no new information. This is really simple. This is not brain surgery. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. By the very title of the organization proves we are not Menza students. (laughs) You're not going to go. Where are you going tonight? An Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Would you be the CEO of my company? Probably not going to happen for normal people. So. This is a game I play. It just shows you how self-centered I am. I'm sitting in a meeting, and I'm bored with it because I'm bored, not because the meeting's boring. Somebody stands sober, including me. And I stay in boring meetings because i got to get through those to get to the interesting ones. Uh, I have a friend of mine that says he only needs to hear one thing in a meeting. He just doesn't know when it's going to happen. So he never leaves. And, And, you know, I feel very spiritually fit when I walk out of a boring meeting and I stayed. To be honest. 
spiritual giants. <laughs> Damn, I'm good, you know? And so, okay, so here's just an example of how, after 23 years, how selfish and self-centered I still am. Aliens bust into the room, and they're going to kill everybody on the planet. But they're going to keep a few of us alive in like a human zoo as an example of the indigenous people that were here. And they picked me to be the leader because I'm so special. <laughs> now that's incredibly self-centered. Why are they going to pick me out of all of you? I'm not the prettiest, the smartest, the tallest, but I'm so special. They're going to pick me. And they're going to let me take 10 of you with me. Now, as soon as I say, I'm, they're going to let me take 10 of you with me, you stop thinking about what I'm saying and think, would it be me? <laughs> let me just tell you this, all the men die. <laughs> I like Wayne, he's dead. Man. <laughs> you know, I'm taking no competition to the island. I'm not getting voted off, all right? Don't feel bad, we're going to starve to death in about two minutes because I'm not picking these women because they know how to build a lean-to or make fire. So <laughs> I may be doing you a favor, I don't know. I mean, that's just incredibly selfish and self-centered. You know? and, 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 and I think the great thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is it has removed that, but I'm smart. You know, Some of people come in at Alcoholics Anonymous and they don't like it. How did I end up here? Well, it was all that drinking you were doing. <laughs> really not a complex question. <laughs> Drink a quart a day, you're probably going to end up here. Right? And then they always think, what do you people want from me? That 72 Hyundai you're driving, that's what we, we really got. <laughs> we really got our eye on that puppy, man. <laughs> I'm ripping you off for that, yep. <laughs> 72 Hyundai, that's what I want. In that case of bad breath, oh yeah. I think actually we will buy you a bra, I don't know. <laughs> but I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I loved it. I loved it from the minute I came in here. It was like... You, I, the, the spiritual principle of first step is hopelessness. I have to be hopeless in order to get this thing. And the spiritual principle for me of the second step is hope. And I got that my very first meeting. My first meeting was May 1st. My sobriety date's May 25th. There was three weeks in there where I was, uh, basically I was going to do the, the four-day off, three-day on program. <laughs> and I thought that was incredibly liberal of me. I was drinking every day. I was going to give you four. I just wanted three. Because I don't think anybody comes into Alcoholics Anonymous wanting to stop drinking. We come in here wanting to give up the consequences of drinking and drink. See, and I don't want, it took me a long time to figure out, I don't want to drink one. I, and those of you who say, I just want one glass of wine with my spaghetti. <laughs> this is one little glass of wine with my spaghetti and I can't. And it did. Oh, Drop dead. You know, I don't even believe you belong in AA if that's really what you're... I don't, I don't want one... I, what I want to be is martini cool. I want to be Frank Sinatra. I want to be a good, hard drinker that can go out and get drunk as a monkey tonight, shake it off and not drink until I want to drink again. That's what I want to be. Because I want the feeling. When Jennifer talked last night, I said to myself, I understand why we drink. She was talking about, we talked about this morning, in emotional sobriety, which is not a good workshop for newcomers because they don't want that. <laughs> when I was new, I wanted to see a fist fight in a meeting, not emotional sobriety. That seemed boring to me. You know, uh, so, so you may not want to go to that one. You know, let's go to fist fights in sobriety and we'll get a lot of newcomers in that one. And if you're new, get right into a relationship. It'll help you work the steps, okay? <laughs> right, I know a lot of your sponsors say no relationships in the first year. I find relationship helps the step work. Uh,
but, but I understand, because Jennifer, Jennifer was talking about all these feelings and going, and, 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 and we're odd. This is an odd group of people. Uh, Father, who is it? Father Leo had the, this book out called God for the Odd. And I thought, that's just so right for me. I am an odd person. I'm always going to be an odd person. Somebody in the meeting said today that for them, sobriety wasn't taking the highs out of the highs and the lows out of the lows. It was accepting that they were a high, high, and a low, low person. Because I spent most of my life trying to be you, and I can't, and I wasn't put here to be you. I was put here to be me, not you. And that's a hard thing for me, because the last thing in the world I ever want to be is me. You know, I want to figure out what you want me to be and then do it, so you'll love me. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't think you would let me stay. That I was good enough to stay. And I can think that today. That lie goes so deep in my hard drive that I doubt that it will ever go away completely. And that is my great blessing because it keeps me dependent and involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because only a day at a time can I live with that. Because if I, if I, if I get away from here too long, that will get so big that I will have to drink because when I drink, it goes away when it's working. I understand why people drink. The fear goes away. The anxiety goes away. You know, I take 4 or 12 ounces of ethyl alcohol. I swallow it. It hits my stomach. And the sun rises. It paralyzes my legs, comes up my chest, goes out my fingers, it flushes my face, and every pore in my body goes, ah. Always gets very quiet at this part of my pitch. See your sphincter's a little tighter. <laughs> There's a little sweat on your lip and you're jonesing, aren't you? You're jonesing. <laughs> you just got a big old shot of dopamine because your body just remembered, ah. Oh. There's a part, you know, people cross their legs and they move because my body remembers that. It remembers what alcohol was like when it was working and forgets what it was like at the end when it stopped working. But I will chase the idea that it will work again till it kills me. Not because I'm stupid but because I have this illness, this malady, the, books that, the, the words that are used in the big book, not disease, the word disease is only used one time in the big book, and it's coupled with the word spiritual. Big book has no opinion of whether this is a disease medically, something that's come into the program. Now, you go in the back of the book, we have Alaska Award, all that stuff, but the book itself, and I think Bill was brilliant, you know, today it's okay to be, for it to be a disease. 20 years from now, they may revoke that again. We're out of that, con we're out of that debate. AA has no opinion about whether alcoholism is a disease or not. It's an illness, it's a malady. And I have this illness and this malady, and it's insanity. And, and I think we hang out with the insanity so much, we don't even re recognize it in a room. We, because it's so much a part of a meeting. Here's the insanity. I'm talking to a guy and I go, what happened? Why did you drink again? And here's the story. And you hear it over and over again. Well, I got out of rehab, I got out of wherever I was, and I got a little job. Got a little job, got a little money. Got a little money, got a little apartment. Got a little apartment, got a little car, got a little car, got a little girlfriend, so I thought I could drink. <laughs> and we sit in the meeting and go, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. And we forget that's absolutely, clinically, psychotically insane. And none of us go, you're nuts. We just, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> because you will never talk to a person and say, what happened? Well, I got out of the hospital, got out of the hospital, I got a little job, got a little job, got a little apartment. Got a little apartment, got a little car, got a little car, got a little girlfriend, and I don't have cancer anymore. The job cured the diabetes. Nobody with any other disease would ever say that, but we'll say it about alcoholism. And believe it, because denial is not strong enough a word for what is wrong with my head. Illusion, delusion, obsession, compulsion. I no longer know that the stove is hot when it comes to alcohol once I have become insane again. I will take the drink if I ever drink again. I absolutely believe it, not knowing any longer that it will hurt me. However I got there. I will think, this time it will be okay. 
or I will think this time it won't be too bad. Both of them equally as insane. Absolutely insane. You know, you don't tell people who, who eat strawberries and break out in hives, they don't have this compulsion to eat strawberries. There's no such thing as Strawberries Anonymous. <laughs> Unless it's a women's stag meeting in CA, but I don't know. But <laughs> it's the thing with alcohol. It's insane, and that's my big problem. That's, you know, I... I uh, You'll notice I haven't said a lot about drinking. I, I'm an alcoholic. I drank a lot. When I start drinking, I can't stop. I, I drank about a half a gallon of wine a day. I did that because if I drank a quart of booze, I was just too hard. I functioned uh, to a degree, but I was going to lose that. I lost a marriage. You know? uh, it's not the worst story in the world, but I am the very first person out of my family to get it sober. And my grandmother and grandfather had four daughters, family of six. It killed half of them. I'm adopted, two mothers, two fathers. It's killed 75% of my parents. And I was the very first person in my family to get sober. And I would have been, if you had looked at my family, picked the first one to die in my generation of alcoholism. Because I'm like that person in the book. When I drank, I drank insanely. I drank as long as there was booze in the house. I didn't go a lot of places. I liked being home. I would go to those bars and take a hostage once in a while. <laughs> you know? I remember the best I ever did in the bar. I was sitting, it was called group therapy, and uh, it was in Columbia, and I was really drunk. And I was sitting there, and the boys' bathroom, the girls' bathroom was right there, and I was waiting to get in the boys' bathroom, and this girl comes out, and I said to her, and, you know, this will turn some of you on now, I said to her, head. Some of you are thinking, I wonder where he's going to be at the dance, aren't you? <laughs> I know, I know. I know, it's a killer line, killer line. And this young lady looked at me and went, Sabahuzahira. <laughs> and we were out of there in five minutes. Yeah, was... But my drinking, I joke, is, it's like this. I sat in my chair and I, I, I cried hysterically. And, you know, I, ca I can't cry like I used to cry when I was drinking. I could cry. <laughs> you know, those animal sounds. <laughs> because they missed the word bubblegum on the $10,000 pyramid. <laughs> and laughing hysterically because Jillian left Seneca one more time on Ryan's Hope. That was it. That's, that's, you know, just one gray day after the other. <laughs> one march day after day into oblivion, having no idea that I first drank set up the phenomena of craving, and that when I tried not to drink, I had this head. I, th there are many sayings in AA I don't like, which is okay, because they're not in the book. The one I really don't like is, nobody poured it down my throat. Well, they poured it down my throat. Somebody poured some drink. I took a million drinks I never wanted to drink. There was this other guy in me that took drinks when I didn't want to drink. I got up in the morning, I'm not drinking. I can't drink. I'm going to lose my wife. I'm shaking. I'm miserable. I don't want to drink. Boom. Wasn't me. I didn't want to take it. See, the book says, and it's really neat because uh, I go to a big book study that reads the stories, which I hate, because then it takes you two years to get back to the first 164 pages, but every time I take a vote and change it, somebody waits for me not to be there and changes it back. <laughs> And, you know, like I could go to another meeting, but I enjoy <laughs> the controversy. Uh, but, and when I was a secretary, it was a big book study, and now I go in there and I try to guess what they read. Uh, but, but, you know, when you go to meetings, you know, like still great things happen. It's to, every meeting is a spiritual entity, as it says in the tradition. So now, it says in the book that I need two things in order to get sober. Two things I have to know. One is, I have to want to stop. I have to want to stop drinking, not rest up, <laughs> not feel better, 
Not get the wife back and the kids, because you see that around Christmas time, don't you? Guys come in because they miss Thanksgiving, the boss is on them, the wife, the kids, the dog doesn't even like them. March 1st, they got the house and the car and her back, and they don't come to meetings anymore. They got what they came for. They didn't come to stop drinking. They came to put the heat off. And many times I don't know why I'm here until I know why I'm here. So I have to know that I want to stop drinking. And then the second thing is, I have to know I can't do it by myself. I think there's probably a problem, drinkers, that know they need to stop drinking and just do it. They never get here. They never get here. Because they're not an alcoholic. Maybe they're not even an alcoholic at all, but they're not an alcoholic like me. I can't do it by myself. And what was really great is, I, I love that because it's just so simple. And then in the story about the third alcoholic, Bill D's story, it says Bob and Bill went and visited him, and the first two questions they asked him was, do you want to stop? We don't care whether you do or not. If you, if you want to drink, that's your business. But do you want to stop? Because if you want to stop, we're here for you. And then the second question they asked him, can you do it on your own? Can you do it on your own? I thought, man, those guys walk like they talk. They actually did what they said in the book. What an amazing thing. So I have to know those two things, because as long as I think I'm going to do it on my own, why am I going to get a home group? Why am I going to learn to get along with you people? Why am I going to walk into a group with people in my home group that I wish would drink because the world would be a better place? <laughs> because, listen, and don't change your home group because if you do, you're going to go to another home group and those people are going to follow you. They will have different names and different earth suits. They will be the same people. Because if God has a lesson for me to learn, changing home groups isn't going to fool him. Where'd Steve go? Oh, I guess he doesn't have to learn anything about tolerance. Changed his home group. So, just, you know, and, and the great thing about a home group is I, you know, I believe that probably the, the most valuable person in this room tonight is the person that's the hardest to love. It's not the most spiritual or the one who's got the most babies. Or, that, those people are easy. That's easy. Everybody likes them. But the one that's hardest to love, the one that just awkward and boring when they share and dull and can't get it. And, and, and the chronic relapser, I hate that phrase. You know the, thing, the other thing I hate in AA? Stick with the winners. I understand it. But this is a spiritual organization, and spiritual org spirituality is not based on winning and losing. The world is based on winning and losing. Not God. See? And so I think that phrase is pick with the people who are serious about staying sober. But there are no losers in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe if you come here and get one day, it's better than never having come here. When did time become God in Alcoholics Anonymous? One minute of sobriety is a miracle. You know? And when people go out, we say, well, I guess they weren't willing. And we never ask ourselves, but where did the willingness come from? See, I can't explain to you why in 1979, when I'm sitting in a chair in a meeting, and there's a guy next to me, and Jennifer talked about this last night, and I'm hearing the message. I'm hearing you don't have to drink anymore. I'm hearing you're alcoholics like me. I'm hearing there's a solution called the steps, which I don't know anything about. I'm hearing just don't drink between meetings. Call us if there's any other problem. That's what I'm hearing, and he's hearing, I guess. He didn't hear it. Why? Because I'm smarter and brighter and cooler and better, and God loves me more? No. That can't possibly be the answer, because then God has favorites. I can't tell you why. But I will tell you, in my home group, when someone dies from drinking, we, create, we treat it as a celebration. Because some of the ways alcoholics are going to stop drinking is to die. Alcoholism has been beaten. You know, they're not going to drink anymore. And so I don't believe there's chronic relapses. I'm a chronic relapser. I just haven't had it. I don't believe there's losers in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe that this is a spiritual organization and that those people that go in and out may... See, because the big book has very specific about this. The big book says over and over then, could not or would not, could not or would not, that the people who don't get this could not, they just couldn't get it. They couldn't get it. Wasn't up. You weren't going to give it to them. I wasn't going to get it. Couldn't get it or wouldn't get it. And I am not to judge. That's what I take that book to mean. I am not to judge. That's not up to me. That's God's business. My job is to simply be of service and give it away. And if God gives it to him, he gives it to him because it ain't, I'm not the message. I am not the light. I'm only the window. You know? and, and that's a very humbling thing. It's very amazing to see what groups do with chronic relapsers. 
No? To see them become the lepers of the group, as if they were a failure. Rather than somebody, you know, my friend Marie Stenner, who talked here in 86, said that she was sitting in a meeting loaded out of her mind, wanting it just as much as she ever wanted it in her sobriety. Just wasn't her time yet. Just wasn't her time. And who am I? Am I going to get arrogant enough to think somebody's had enough chances? That's it? That's it? I'm not going to work with you anymore. You're not serious. How can you be serious with this guy? You know? You're a very good person. Very good person. You have just one drink. You have just one drink. You can have one drink. Just have one drink. Just have one drink. What is a Zima? What is a Zima? <laughs> what is a Zima? What's a dry beer? How can it be wet and dry, 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 wet and dry. All right, all right, all right, all right, we don't have alcohol. Let's have a non-alcoholic beer. And, and let me just say, I, I don't drink non-alcoholic beers. If you do, you're fine. I think you're still sober. I don't have any opinions about that. You know, I don't drink them because for me to drink a non-alcoholic beer would be like for me to go to a house of prostitution to listen to the piano player. <laughs> See, I'm going to tell myself I'm going for the music, the Bach, the Mozart. I'm getting the room, okay? Now, if you're new, he talks to you a little different than he talks to me, because i got 23 years, he's tried all that. But if you're new, he says something like this. Okay, 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 okay. I mean, you know, I mean, he just runs. Sometimes I took drinks to shut him up. Remember that? Before you got somewhere, you'd say, you didn't want to drink, you just wanted him to shut up. And if you got him drunk, he would shut up and leave you alone. If you could figure out a way to get him drunk and not you, you'd have done that. I didn't want to drink it. I just wanted him to drink. Here, buy a drink. So if you knew, he goes, okay, 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 okay. You got 90 days. You got 90 days. You better drink soon, or you're gonna have so much time you can never drink again. Now look, that is insane. I want to go back. This is insane logic. The logic is not drinking life better, therefore, only logical conclusion, if I continue not to drink, my life will probably get better, at least stay this good. Not an alcoholic world. Not drinking life good, drink. That's the logic. And we go, yeah, that makes sense. I think I'll have one. Thank you very much. Oh, I'll tell you a thing that scared the hell out of me. I sponsored the guy for a long time. I lost track of him. He had 13 years when he relapsed. He first relapsed on cocaine, smoked that for a while. And then one day he went into a bar and had a beer. And this is what he told me. He said, for Steve, for 30 minutes, I felt the best I had felt in 13 years. And I believe that's probably true. Because I don't think the steps always work as quickly. And they don't anesthetize the way an ounce of ethyl alcohol does. You know, this is organic growth in here. It's painful and slow. I mean, it took me 20 years to let the tailgater pass. <laughs> it took me 20 years to learn that lesson. I got guys that call me and say, Steve, how can I make the fight with my girlfriend go better? And I have to say to him, I think if you stop saying, look, bitch, it will go better. <laughs> And they look at me like I'm crazy. Are you sure? Have you tried this? If I didn't say that, what would I say? How about honey, darling, sweetheart? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> now, look, I know if I ever took a drink. You know, you're a very good person. You're a very good person. You have just one drink. You have 23 years. Just have one drink. Just have one drink. Just have one drink. That, what's a Long Island iced tea? A drink I never had. I know, and people go, ooh. People actually encourage me to relapse when I tell them that. <laughs> Yeah, throw 23 years away, Steve. You need to have a Long Island iced tea. I like that. That much alcohol, that much mixer, my kind of drink. So if I ever took the drink, you're a very good person, you're very good. As soon as it hit my stomach, bam, you rotten, stinking loser, you. You just threw away 23 years. Why don't you drink your miserable self to death? And, and if I could ever get out in front of me, I'd go, you guys aren't consistent. We don't have to be, we're demons. <laughs> we get to lie. Our job's to kill you, so why do you talk to us? Then you're sponsor! <laughs> now, if you thought I was exaggerating when I said Alcoholics Anonymous is lame, I would just like to point out to you, for the last five minutes, you've watched a man talk to his hands as if they were puppets and have been enjoying yourself. <laughs> that is lame.
I'm sure when you were doing a little blow and a little stoli, you wouldn't have thought that was so interesting. <laughs> Driving the Porsche down the road. If I get to Oklahoma, they'll stop following me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a helicopter because I don't want it to be. <laughs> See, alcohol's a pimp. Alcohol's a pimp, and every man or woman here is his boy and his girl. You know, you're going to go to Thanksgiving because Grandma's there. You need to see Grandma. I haven't been there for a while. You know, just going over to Thanksgiving, and alcohol says, "Get in the car. Where's my money?" You need you need a little you need a little bolt for Timmy's bike because it's Christmas and it didn't come. And you're just going to run down to the hardware store. You're just going down the hardware store, coming right back because little Timmy's got to have his bike for Christmas. Alcohol says, "Get in the car. Where's my money?" Dad's dying of stomach cancer, and you're going to the hospital because, damn it, you're going to be there for Dad. You're going to be there because Dad's been there for you, and you're going to put it together this time, and you're going to go to the hospital, and you're going to sit with Dad and hold his hand while he dies, and alcohol says, get in the car, and where's my money? And then some nice judge or therapist sends you to A&A, and &A, Pent becomes very white. Oh, who loves you, baby? I won't hurt you. <laughs> People at A&A are mean, baby. Get in the car, baby. I love you. <laughs> Get in the car. Where's my money? You know, that's it. You know, I, I, I just want to tell you, if you're new and mating is about to start, uh, remember, remember if you're new, not on Friday night. Not on Friday night. They know where you live. Remember, Sunday you'll be checking out. And you can be whoever on Sunday, astronaut, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I believe God's got us in a double bind. I believe God's got us in a double bind. I believe I will work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous or I will work the program of alcoholism, but what I won't do is not not work a program. And if you're like me, I hate that. I want to think I have a choice. I choose to stay sober today. Huh? No, I, I can't choose to stay sober. All I can do is choose to put myself in a position that will maybe keep me sober or put myself in a position that might get me drunk. That's all I can choose. If I could choose sober, I wouldn't be here, folks. I can go to a meeting and maybe stay sober or I can stay home and probably drink and listen to him, but I can't choose sobriety. I just choose where the body is today. I love it. Texas has got a saying. You guys, everybody said, you're another one of those California speakers. I'm sorry. I apologize for California. I'm sorry so many of us come here and talk. I'm sorry some of us spend all of our weekend getting to people and leaving. I apologize for that. <laughs> I'm sorry I got here last. I'm sorry. Uh, but but I, at our convention, we don't have anybody from, South, from Southern California, so we have a lot of Texas speakers. I thought, boy, Texas has a lot of speakers, so, and we don't resent them. Uh, <laughs> Because we're more spiritually advanced. But <laughs> but, <laughs> but I heard this Texas saying, they go, you first go to meetings because you have to, then you go to meetings because you want to, and finally you go to meetings because it's 8 o'clock. I love that. That's exact. I go to meetings. I go to the same meeting. I go because I don't want to drink. You know? And I don't know. I don't know. So I can work. Alcoholics Anonymous, or I can work the program of alcoholism, and I don't get this choice, and I hate that, but I was trying to think, well, what would the program of alcoholism be like? And I don't know about you, but my 12-step program before I came here went something like this. One, I declared I was in complete control of my drinking, and my life was fine and dandy. Thank you very much. Two, I always knew there was no power greater than myself, but all of you needed to be restored to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of alcohol because it was the only thing that understood me. Four, made a paranoid and immoral inventory of anybody but me. <laughs> Five, admit nothing to nobody ever. Six, became entirely willing to have God punish you for all your defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to go bug somebody else. Eight, made a list of all persons who had harmed me and became willing to take revenge upon them all. Nine, took direct revenge whenever possible, especially when to do so would injure them and others. Ten, continue to take your inventory, and when you were wrong, promptly told you so. 
Eleven, sought through alcohol and medication to improve my unconscious contact with myself, praying only for what I wanted when I wanted it and the power to get it. And twelve, having achieved spiritual death as a result of these steps, I tried to carry this message to other alcoholics and take just as many of them with me as I could. You know, two 12-step programs side by side, and I, the alcoholic, will work one or I will work the other. What I will not do is not not work a program. And my experience here, you know, I, I'm going to stop now, but my experience here is God wants everything. And this, this deal really isn't about even getting sober. It's about, I've got to get sober to do the deal, but it's about my relationship with God. My relationship with you is about my relationship with God. They say, well, I, I, I'm just having trouble with the spiritual part of the program. And we always say the whole thing is spiritual. But life is spiritual. All of life. Not just in the meeting. The book says the greater demonstration of these principles is out there in my job, with my family, with those other people. Because every time I encounter you, I encounter God. And he wants it all. And I, I will tell you this, just because this is my experience, I don't have a comfortable relationship with God this year. You know, I don't. God is a problem. You know, I, I'll tell you one problem I have with him. He loves you as much as he loves me. I don't like this. Don't get me wrong. I want him to love you. I want him to love you. I'm happy he loves you. I just want him to love me that much more. The reason I do this is not because I'm such a jerk. It's because I don't feel okay if I'm okay. I have to be special to be okay. See? If I'm just okay, I'm not okay. So I need to be special. But see, if I'm special, see, then but God doesn't love me because of what I am or what I'm not. He loves me because of who he is. It takes all the performance out. Because I promise you, everybody in here has their boundaries. Everybody in here, I, I don't believe I'm capable of unconditional love. Sometimes when I get cleaned out, like the St. Francis prayer, unconditional love flows through me. What the, I believe is the group is capable of unconditional love on a good day. Because I've got to tell you, every old timer I've ever met, I've seen him be complete, a complete jerk. I've seen him on days when I wouldn't want to hear a thing they said, because they were human. And that's what I was going to say in the beginning. On page 63, Bill compares us to the bank robber. The minister, he doesn't compare us to other alcoholics. And then the alcoholic who is drunk and left everything. And finally I thought, you know what he's telling me? When I stop drinking, I don't have untreated alcoholism. I believe I have something far worse than that. I have a thing called humanity. I become a human being. You cut off my wings. I am like that, them out there. See, alcohol gave me wings to fly, and then it took away the sky. When I'm drinking, I'm bulletproof. You take away the magic elixir, and now I am subject to all the shocks that flesh is heir to. I am human, and the thing I hate the most is being human and fallible and making mistakes and imperfect and having feelings and all the things that God and his idiocy somehow thought were good or he wouldn't have created them. Sadness and anger, and I'm not talking about the anger of the big book, because the anger of the big book, I honestly believe, is acting angry, not the feeling of anger. Because I'm an alcoholic. I don't understand having a feeling and not acting on it. If I'm mad at you, I hit you. If I love you, I sleep with you. That's the way it goes, right? <laughs> You just don't have a feeling to experience it. It's something you do. You know? And to learn you can have a feeling and don't have to do anything. I know that's an al -Anon concept, but it, it works for us too. <laughs> and I will tell you, you know, uh, I believe Paul and I love Paul. I believe what Paul says that nothing in God's universe happens without his permission. Nothing happens without accident. But that's a dilemma for me. Because if you want to put that to free will, who created free will? And obviously, if God gave us free will, in my opinion, we're not capable of handling it. That's like letting a two-year-old kid drive a car. We'd put a parent in jail. And even if you explain away the free will, how come the planet isn't childproof? You know? If any of you had a house built like this planet, we'd put you in jail if you had children. Where I live, the continental shelves don't even meet. We have earthquakes. Why couldn't a loving God build a planet with no earthquakes? You know? I don't know the answer to that. I can't explain it to you, and yet I believe there's a loving God. And, and, you know, the answer I finally came down to, because I'll tell you what, I worked in a psych hospital that would make you beg for alcoholism. It's a locked ward with people with no money and no hope and some diseases that they just got because they got them, because they exist, and they're miserable. I wish a drink could fix some of them, you know. To keep them anesthetized most of their life probably would be a blessing, you know. And I can't 
answer why they have their life and I have mine. You know, I can't answer if God is the employer why some people have big contracts and some people seem to have a really crappy job in the company. You know, I can't answer that question. I can't give you simple answers. For me, this experience of God is to live in some kind of tension, to believe there is a loving God and not be able to explain it all away, simply. You know, and we get that way. You know, when somebody dies, we don't go in there and, well, work the steps, be grateful, you had them for a while. We just sit and we laugh when they laugh and when they cry when they cry. When my bomb went off, when I was out in my yard and the bomb went off, they found out this woman was cheating and I was out there and I was working on the marriage and the bomb goes off and all of a sudden you're, you're doing your life and the bomb goes off and all of a sudden there's a flash of light and you close your eyes and you open your eyes and everything is gone. All of it's gone. Plano, Irvine, wherever those things are that I came out here, and this way, Oklahoma City, whatever that. Whatever's here, it's gone. The lake's gone. It's all moonscape. Everything you ever believed in is gone and you're sitting there naked and your hair's on fire. And for me, it was this relationship. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's getting older. I don't know what it's going to be for you. Maybe it happens over and over again. We're coming up on an anniversary for people that had this happen to them last year. Everything changes in the blink of an eye. Those people that say God will never give you more than they can handle, I don't agree with that. Life can give me more than I can handle in the blink of an eye. Hopefully, if I'm willing, God will give me the ability to handle whatever comes along, and that's a very different story. See, I am not Gandhi. So you're sitting there and you're naked and your hair's on fire and there's nothing left and all of a sudden your vision clears and there's this blue building down there. In my mind it's Big Book Blue, not the new color. <laughs> I really don't want to know how much they spent on designing this. It's the UCLA Big Book. But uh, <laughs> is that politics? Okay. So, but I do love 449s now and 417 because you know that's going to be a conference tree. Now 470, that's not 417, 449. So you wander down to this big blue building because it's the only thing left and you're staggering in there and it's an AA building and it's bomb proof. And you look in this big glass window cause, and there's these guys playing pinochle and in my mind we were talking about this today, they're smoking. You know, I, I remember AA meetings when you couldn't even see the leader because there was so much smoke in them. <laughs> look at the old pictures of this meeting, they're smoking at the registration desk. And you, know, and you go in there and, and now you knock on the window. Now remember, you're naked, your hair's on fire. Most people go, ah, you know, but this is AA, so they go, come on in, come on in. <laughs> Moving on in. And you go in there and you, they go, bomb went off, huh, Steve? Mm, yeah. Unless somebody want to get Steve a cup of coffee, a, a towel, and put his hair out. <laughs> and you sit in that meeting and, you know, I thought they'd go, what step were you on? Your picker broke, all that crap. Nobody ever said that to me, you know. I, I'd go to that meeting and I'd start crying. I didn't mean to cry because sometimes at 16 years of sobriety, I was the most hurting alcoholic in the room. And my job as the alcoholic was to be willing to go at 16 because my head said, you should be better than this. You can't go. You have to be an example. And I believe I was an example by going in there broken and letting newcomers know... <laughs> that life can hurt at 16 years as much as it hurts at 16 days. Because I had thought being good had become God. And I thought if I just tried hard enough, everything would go all right. And I learned you can do it all right and it turn out all wrong. That's just the world we live in. Can't explain it to you. Doesn't matter what God looks like. God could look like Stalin. He's still God. I love people who go, well, I couldn't accept that kind of God. Where are you going to get another one? <laughs> not about me to figure out whether I'm going to, you know, I just got to figure out what God is and accept that there is no alternative. Like, okay, we're voting you out. It's not the secretary of the meeting. <laughs> it's God. <Yeah. laughs> He's the father, we're the children. He's the agent, we're the employee. Uh, pretty clear to me. Because I'd vote on gravity, folks. Don't like it. Want to get it out? <laughs> Kingdom of God is not a democracy. Oh, well. So... <laughs> So when I'd be sitting in that meeting starting crying, there would be like a three-year-old arm would come around my shoulder. And I wouldn't go, nope, you must have 17 years to hug me. I can only hug you. No, no I just took it. And then, and sometime it would be a drug addict arm. Wouldn't even be an alcoholic arm. Just be a drug addict arm at an AA meeting. 
And I wouldn't go, primary purpose, unless you identify as an alcoholic. I cannot allow you to... <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I'm an alcoholic, alcoholic. I've never met a drug. Alcohol couldn't help. I'm alcohol. I'm primary purpose. But when your guts are on the floor, that doesn't matter. Only thing that matters is the hug. And you guys laughed when I laughed, and you cried when I cried. And you let me heal. And you let me be broken. And you didn't try to fix it, most of you. God, where do you teach that? To people who are the losers of the world. The runners, people who become mothers and fathers that I would love to be a child with, you know. People I would have not trusted a cat to, and I see kids with them today, and I just go, no, those kids are so safe. This is a wonderful place. One and one equals three here. You know. <laughs> one and one equals three. I can't explain it. If you're not having fun in your home group, I don't know where you're going. This is the greatest show on the face of the earth for two bucks. <laughs> and I just love I love I love the people I don't like because they're there to teach me something, you know. And uh, and uh, I would tell you about my heroes, but it's time to mate or date or shop. Uh, <laughs> a little checking out. I will leave you with the story I always leave you with. This is your story now. You're welcome to tell it. A little story I made up. It's about the third step. This is, I believe, the, God, the deal that God's cuts with all of us. There's a drunk, and he's sick, and he's hurting, and he's hung out, and he's coming home one day, and he runs into God, and God's got something in his hand. And the drunk goes, what's that? And God goes, this is sobriety. And the drunk goes, oh, man, because he's at that magic moment of surrender. I need that. Jeez, I need sobriety. How much does that cost? Because the alcoholic on the stands buying stuff. And God goes, well, how much have you got? And the drunk goes, well, I have about $50. And God, being God, says, all right, for you, sobriety costs $50. Now, the drunk trying to back out of the deal goes, whoa, whoa, if I give you all $50, I won't have any gas for my car. And God goes, oh, you have a car. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but sobriety is going to cost you your car. He says, whoa, whoa, if I give you my car, how am I going to get to my job? He says, oh, you have a job. No, 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 no. Sobriety costs you your job. Well, wait, if I give you my job, how am I going to pay for my house? House? You have a house? I thought you were in the cardboard box down by the railroad. I didn't know you had a house. Your list is completely out of date. No, no, no. Sobriety costs you your house. It goes, well, what about my wife and my kids? A family? That's right. You have a family. Yes, yes, yes. No, sobriety is going to cost you your family. He goes, but if I give you all that, what good is my life? And God goes, that's right. Sobriety costs you your life. And the alcoholic, because he's at that magic moment of surrender, is willing to give his God his money and his car and his house and his wife and his kids and his job and his life. And his daddy gives him sobriety. Then he looks him deep in the eye and he says, all right, I'm going to give you your money back, but it's not your money anymore. It's my money. You get to spend it for me. I'm going to give you a car back. It's not your car anymore. It's my car. You, you may have a Mercedes Benz, but you better scotch guard that puppy because I want drunks capable of throwing up in it. Because if you've got a car too good to throw up in, you've got a car too good for a sober alcoholic because it's not your car. It's my car, but you're going to drive it for me. I'm going to give you your job back. It's not your job anymore. It's not about being important or doing anything other than being something like me to the people you work with because it's not your job. It's my job, but you're going to work it for me. I'm going to give you your house back. It's not your house anymore. It's my home, but you get to live in it for me. I'm going to give you your family back, and based on your behavior, they have a right never to talk to you ever again, but I'm going to give them back to you because it's not your family, it's my family. You get to take care of them for me. I give you your life back and it's never your life ever again. It's my life, but you get to live it for me. That's the deal I believe a loving God cuts with all of us in the third step. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous is so much about, for me, not cursing the darkness anymore, but just simply lighting a candle one at a time, one newcomer at a time, one meeting at a time, one day at a time, without having to retreat back into that chaos of drinking just to breathe in and out and be able to tolerate the world. Thank you so much. Please keep coming back. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.